Good afternoon. Thanks for coming back for another sermon. I want to uh, speak about a topic that's actually uh, pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, and it, uh, much of my growth spiritually has come from this topic. Um, and today we're going to talk about brokenness. Brokenness. Um, and the question that I have for you tonight is, <clears throat> are we broken at the condition of the church, the unbeliever, and the sin in our own life? And does it cause us to weep? Um, this is a this this particular uh, topic is very um, close to me just because I spend most of my time in these regions in brokenness and weeping anymore. So before we get started, let's go into a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God. I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ just to thank you for another day. Thank you for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, I know that our world looks like it's coming unhinged and unraveled at the seams. But you are still in control and you are who you say you are. Forgive us of our sins, my God, as we continue to strive towards you. Be with us during this message. Holy Spirit, search us and know us and move us aside and speak through us. In Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. All right, I'm going to have uh, more scripture to read today than normal. Uh, so if, you'll, if you were able to kind of keep up with all the page turning, I'd appreciate it. First piece of scripture we're going to go to is Isaiah 66, verse 2. Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. Now, if you'll turn quickly to Luke 19, 41 through 44. It's Luke 19, 41 through 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And one more, Matthew 23 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is, the, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, I wanted to read those three because from Isaiah, we hear who God favors. And then in Luke and in Matthew, we see Christ weeping and broken over the condition of his people and his city and his nation. I, 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 the, we're gonna, I'm going to break this up in some sections here. The first one we're going to look at being broken for the condition of your country of your people, of the unbelievers, of the church. It's more of an outwardly broken. You're going to look outward at the different things that cause brokenness. So we're going to kind of touch base on each of these. Isaiah, the humble and the contrite of heart, finding remorse and grief, and then to tremble at his word to know that it is the inspired word of God. And for that to cause that, that reaction is really what it's called, is really what it's for. Uh, we, when we read, I often wonder if we still like this or we just kind of scan through the pages. It's just very, very quickly. We don't really read the words as they're read or as they're written. And as we move forward, Luke 19, 
Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And then he says, if only you had known what would bring you peace this day. If you had known, if you understood, do we understand? If you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. You know, I heard a, I'm trying to remember who, who said it. Either Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill or um, I can't, can't recall. But he said, when God finally calls you to repentance, when you feel the draw of the Holy Spirit, and it says, repent, don't harden your heart. Because if you do, there's no guarantee that the Lord will ever deal with you again. And that kind of reminds me in this scripture here. But now it is hidden from your eyes because you could not accept your Messiah. It's hidden from you. You were given a stupor. You were given a blinding, a veil. So, as we look at the condition of the church, as we look at the condition of our country, as we look at the unbeliever, are you broken for them? Are you broken for them? You know, we see uh, our country right now as unraveled as it seems with the riots and the beatings and the uh, murders and the political unrest, the political, uh, it's just maddening. As much as it's constantly around, it's maddening. It's almost too much. And we look at the uncertainty of everything, but we yet we know that our God is still on his throne. But though the condition of it, does it, does it pull at you? Do your heartstrings get pulled at all? Are we so hard? Are we so jaded? Have we seen so much that we can see a woman get stumped to death in the street and say, well, that's just how it is. That's just how it is now. It's, it, that's just a day-to-day -day occurrence. We're so jaded by everything that nothing draws an emotional response from us anymore as far as brokenness and weeping over the condition of a fallen man. We've seen too much. Babies slaughtered by the thousands to the God of convenience and comfort. I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, this is really just me asking a question. Is the church too jaded now? Have we been around it too often and too much where the soft hearted and the sensitivity of the spirit is gone? Where we see churches that are falling away and splitting up or that they're falling into this deceptive trap of prosperity and faith preaching. That we can physically be like God, have our best life now, and then get it later? Do we weep over that? Are we broken at all? Or do we just kind of like, yeah, you know, that's just how it is. It's just how it is, or the I don't cares, that is not a good response to these things. We should be in prayer and in brokenness and weeping over the word of God, over the condition of things. It's not about you just hardening your heart to the call of the Spirit. It's about you hardening your heart to every aspect of life. We no longer can have compassion on anybody. I spoke about compassion last week. It's too much for us. It's an inconvenience to be compassionate. Rage and malice, that's much more convenient. Much more convenient. And to turn a blind eye or to ignore is much more convenient than to weep and be broken over somebody. Because that ruins our day. When something affects us that deeply, it ruins our day, and we want to have a good day. We want it. We want it. And so to let something affect us that deep, it would really take us out of a place of having a good day because we had to witness this. I had to see the homeless man get spat on or cursed at or the woman that carries her baby down the street that has no idea how to feed him. There's nothing there. Or you see on the news, churches being shut down. Or people extorting people. It is just constant. We should all be in sackcloth and ashes and broken. But I digress. So then in Matthew. Matthew Jesus talks about it a little differently. And instead of saying it is hidden from you. He says I long to gather you. I long to gather you. 
like a hen gathers her chicks under the wing. But you were not willing. I wanted to. I wanted to. Christ wanted his people to accept him. But they would not. As prophecy stated, they wouldn't. They were unwilling, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, as they had been for generations before. And now look, your house is left to you desolate and you will not see me again until my second coming, until I come again. And then, you'll, then you will assume that this is, the, this is the first time. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm sure that's how many Jews will eventually see it. I'm sure the question that will be asked on that day is, have you been here before? Were you here before? Because we were taught all through Judaism that you were not the Christ. Have you been here? I don't know how you can look at the state of the church and of, and of um, the family, the Christian family, and not be broken. I mean, we're, we're falling apart. And yet the remnant is still as strong as ever and is still being cared for by the Almighty for those who love him. But to see the brokenness of society and not be stirred. Is there a stirring in your heart? And not only that, is there a stirring and a response? Does it stir you enough to have a response? Or is it just we've seen it all too much? We see it all too much. We see the people deceived. We see the people hurt. We see the people financially taken advantage of. We see all these things way too much and we just kind of lightly brush it off. Well, that's just how it is. That's how it is. There's no need for me to be upset about it. There's nothing that I'm going to do that's going to change that. But that doesn't mean you don't need to be broken over it. Brokenness. So much growth comes from a place of brokenness. So let's move on. I want to talk, I want to, uh, let's go to Psalm 51. You know, seeing all of this on the news and it's just a lot, isn't it? It's just a lot. So let's read Psalm 51. I'm going to read the whole thing. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create me in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You are, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper, Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifice of the righteous in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Can you hear David's brokenness? Can you hear him broken over the sin in his life? I can. 
I can hear his brokenness. Whatever this particular psalm is, is alluding to, whether it is um, his adultery with Bathsheba or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it was that David had done that he was referring to in the Psalm 51, um, he was broken. And there's that word again, contrite, a contrite heart, a remorseful heart, a grieving heart, a heart that says, I know that the sin in my life cannot stand in front of you and you have to, as it said, turn your face from me. Are you broken over the sin in your life? Or have you made concessions with it? Is there sin in your life that you no longer consider sin anymore? It's been there so long, you've been feeding it so long that it is now a permanent resident in your life. And there's nothing about it that bothers you anymore. There's no uh, anguish in your spirit over that thing. There's no brokenness. And here we see David, a man after God's own heart, in his sin is so broken that he says, you desired faithfulness for me in the womb. And you taught me wisdom in the secret place. Turn your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. He knew he had sinned and he was broken by his sin because he knew God could not be in the presence of sin. So, I'll ask again, are you broken for the sin in your life? Or are you so arrogant to think you have none? I don't say this uh, um, in, in any kind of judgment or condemnation, but there's many people that believe they're just good people, and that's good enough. And scripture clearly says there is none good, no, not one. Or they'll say, well, the Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows my heart. Even though I do this thing, he knows where I really feel, how, how I really feel. You're absolutely right, he does. As Jeremiah would say, the heart is the most deceitful thing ever. Every part of the human being is encased in the heart. So you're absolutely right, he does know your heart and how evil and conceited and arrogant and self-seeking that it actually is. There's nothing good about the human heart. There's no not one. That's why secular people will say, follow your heart. What they mean is, do what you want to do. Feed the flesh. Give it its desires that it wants. Follow your heart. That is completely contrary to Scripture. That's completely contrary to following Christ. You are not to follow your heart. You're to do the actual opposite of what your flesh desires. That's an encasement of flesh in its essence is the heart. No, 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 no. You're supposed to listen to the Spirit. You're supposed to listen to Christ. You're supposed to listen to his word and follow his commandments, which is a direct conflict with the flesh. And so when we do, when we do fall, when we're running the race and we're, we're, we're striving and we're, we're doing well and, you know, we, we, we've died to certain sins and then we fall. And David fell in whatever he was talking about here. And he was broken. You, you feel much more deeply hurt and broken and weeping with so many tears when you know what you've done is wrong. When you know what you've done is wrong. It's one thing to do something and not feel anything about it because you don't believe it's wrong. But when you understand that sin is wrong and how the God that you serve looks at the sin in your life, you can't help but fall to your knees and weep. I wish... There was more broken people in the church and had a soft heart and a receiving ear than what we have today. I don't believe too many people weep over the sin in their life. I don't believe too many people even search their own life and find out maybe that they've got sin in their life that they don't really, that they don't even realize that they have. Everybody has that closet, that mental, spiritual closet that they stuff stuff in. And eventually that stuff just has been in there so long that we've forgotten it's there. We've forgotten that it's just such a part of our life that we go on and nothing ever changes. And so my challenge to you is go into that closet. Open that door and you drag that stuff out into the light and then have to deal with it. 
Whatever it comes to. Killing it off or broken and weeping over the fact that this is still here. Two, two years ago, roughly two years ago, I struggled with sexual sin for 30 years now. For a long, long time. And about two years ago, I hit my knees and was completely broken and shattered over the sin in my life. And I vowed, I had grew up in the church. I've been baptized as a, as, a, as a young man, made a confession of faith as a young man, but did not truly know what it meant to follow Christ. I didn't truly know what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was always about getting out of hell. I don't want to go there. And so in my selfish self-preservation, I looked at God as my ticket out of hell. And I never really truly understood what it means to work out your faith in its essence and to completely surrender your life and pick up your cross daily and follow him until about two and a half, two, roughly two years ago. And in that moment of brokenness, in that moment of on my knees in this very room, weeping and sobbing over the sin in my life, I had made it up in my mind that it was it. I was done. I no longer chased any of the dreams of, of, of my youth. I put that aside. I no longer chased any, any uh, um, anything really of my own. I wanted to fully commit my life to Jesus Christ in whatever he wanted from me. And that came from a place of brokenness. I would have never gotten there unless I had been broken over the sin in my life as we see David in Psalm 51 being broken over the sin in his life. In brokenness, we have growth. We have growth. And so that's why I have this channel. And I, I do um, a couple different other things as well. Because it's no longer about me. See, that's the thing. It can no longer be about you. It has to be about Christ. If everything you own belongs to him, even your life, then how can it be about you? It can't. It can't be about you. I don't know what it's going to take to bring the church to its knees in brokenness, in a spiritual growth and not spiritual blindness. But I pray for that. I pray that the church be broken for the unbelievers, for the condition of the church, for the sin in their life. I pray that prayer. Last piece of scripture we're going to talk about. Before I go on, my prayer for you, whoever you are, is that your brokenness over your own sin in your life leads you to repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what I hope for your life. So let's go to John 12, 24. John 12, 24. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Have you ever seen one of those slow motion videos of a seed when, it, when it's planted and they've got the glass like up against the, the dirt so you can bit clearly see the seed in the, in the glass and in the dirt? And as the slow motion goes, um, you see it start to get soft. A seed is rather hard when you put it in the ground. And then as the moisture of the soil and the, the nourishment of, of the minerals in the soil softens the outer coat of the seed, it begins to get soft. And then as internally it starts to grow, what happens to that seed? It breaks. 
the outer hardened has now become softened and broken. And as it breaks, new life springs up from the death of that seed. And as the stalk continues up the, up the dirt, it breaks free of its old life as a seed. And as it breaks the ground, it feels the sun's rays on its face. And it can't help but go higher. It can't help but climb higher. That is the definition of what it means to do that, to be that, to feel that, to be broken in a place that eventually growth comes. But you have to be softened. You have to be uh, not stiff-necked. And eventually, you have to break. There is a moment in your life for a true believer when that brokenness happens. And it is a violent break. It's a snapping open because it's been softened over years of being weeping by your own tears. Maybe that's how it was softened, by the tears of your own weeping. And eventually it snaps open and the shell falls away and new life springs forth. And as the Lord shines on you and waters you and nourishes you, you eventually produce a harvest that is considered righteous in the eyes of God. But not before you're broken and you die to your own life, old life. So don't love your life as so much as to cling to the old ways. Don't do that. There's no growth there. Absorb the nourishing nutrients that Christ offers you and be broken over the sin in your life, over the condition of the church, and over your nation. I pray that every single one of you would be broken and in a place where you could weep over one of those three things, if not all. And I love you deeply. And like always, God bless.